So, viewports, the bane of the LibGDX beginner. Viewports are a critical component to controlling how players peer into the world you've created for them. And yet some people manage to make games without them. How do they do that? And more importantly, why? Viewports will dramatically improve the visual way your game is consumed by players. They are very easy to understand after grasping a few key concepts. Most people make the mistake of jumping straight into projections and world units and all that jazz. No. Let's just look at a game without a viewport. See, it doesn't look like there's anything wrong here. But, what if you resize the window? Ah, yes. That indeed looks like crap. And what if we want our game to work on various devices with different aspect ratios? We want everyone to have a similar experience, and we certainly don't want anyone to have an unfair advantage. We need to have some way of controlling that. Let's apply a fit viewport. You have to provide a world width and height to create one. Think of these values as the size of your game window under perfect conditions for now. 800 by 800 is a fine example. Let's do our resize again. We're always going to have the same aspect ratio. This world we define will always be visible. The trouble is that we get these black borders on the side. It's like trying to watch an old movie on a modern widescreen TV. Monitors are no longer square. Choosing a viewport is all about compromise. Fit viewport's concession is adding black borders. Fill viewports is cutting off part of the view to fill the entire screen. It maintains the same aspect ratio, but some of the world is going to be hidden. Neither of these are completely ideal. That's why a lot of people go with extend viewport for their games. It keeps the aspect ratio like a fit viewport, but to avoid the black borders, it extends the visible world to fill in the empty space. So you're not going to have full control of the view dimensions, but this is the best option for explorable worlds. The truth is you have to pick the best viewport for the circumstances of your game. And you don't have to stick with one viewport either. You can have a different viewport for every screen. For example, your game screen could have an extend viewport and your menu could have a screen viewport. Screen viewport is ideal for UI because it will always be pixel for pixel. No black borders and no stretching. If your window is 540 by 1080, your world would be 540 by 1080. With Scene2D's ability to dynamically resize widgets with 9 patches and the like, there's really no need for any other viewport in this context. This is really the only way to avoid nasty blurring of fonts and edges. The exception to this is pixel art games, but those should be using advanced setups with frame buffers. How about a game screen with a user interface overlaid on the top? Best way to achieve this is by having two viewports at the same time. You can, in fact, use as many viewports as you want simultaneously. You just have to make sure to apply each viewport before you start drawing things for that layer. So I apply the extend viewport to draw my game world, then I apply my screen viewport to draw the Scene2D stage on top. Hey, yeah, I'm talking to you. We've been avoiding the conversation about world units so far. Let's talk. I like pixels. My monitor resolution is measured in pixels. My game graphics are made out of pixels. Coming from using the AWT canvas from way back, pixels make sense to me. But your game world is not made up of pixels. A lot of you use libraries like Box2D to handle your physics and collision detection. Box2D uses meters. For scale, your player character could be just one meter tall. This works because measurements are nice and small. You get more floating point error when you increase the scale of your numbers. Box2D would simply implode if you tried to feed it pixel values. I have to admit, I use pixel units for my jam games, and I always regret it when I'm defining gravity in tens of thousands of pixels per frame. Not good. Even if you don't use Box2D, using meters or any sort of game unit that you define is also a lot simpler to work with and conceptualize. Now some people come up with some crazy formulas to convert from pixel to meter. That is not necessary. You define your viewports in your world units. So. My example of a viewport before, 800 by 800 pixels. For simplicity, I'll just say 1 meter is 100 pixels, but you come up with your own scale that matches the elements of your game. This could be the size of your player or your tiles if you're making a tile-based game. 
We'll now create our new viewport as 8x8 units. Then we'll position the elements of our game in game units and the speed the player moves in units per frame. We functionally have the same game, but the units are a lot saner now. There are some things that cannot be measured in game units, however. Input for one thing is measured in pixels relative to the window. That's fine because we can unproject the screen coordinates. There are two methods available to us. Unproject transforms from screen coordinates to world units. Project transforms from world units to screen coordinates. An analogy you can use for this is a movie projector. Your game lives in the projector on those tiny film frames. It is projected onto the big screen, or the game window in our case, for your audience to see. And when you have a point on the screen that needs to go back into the game, it needs to be unprojected. Take a look at the examples linked in the description. Yes, every viewport has a camera that you can use for project unproject, but that camera is capable of so much more. This is what you manipulate during gameplay to change the position of the camera. Now the view follows the player character. You can modify the movement to be a little smoother, to be less jarring, but this all depends on the type of game you want to make. You can even use the camera to add a screen shake effect. Another trick is to change the zoom of the camera. You can give the player direct control of the zoom so they can set it to a comfortable level, or you can have the gameplay define the zoom. In VTOL, I used a dynamic zoom based on the player's speed so they can see obstacles ahead of them. With control of the zoom and position, you can make your game more cinematic. You can add points of interest or rest control from the player during the story breaks. You've got the basics of viewports down. Now let's get crazy. You can use viewports for more than just your main view. You can use it for mini maps as well as split screen. How this is done is by setting the position and size of an additional viewport and overlaying it on top of your main view for the mini map. And for the split screen, Position and resize the two viewports side by side. It's that simple. I think the gold standard for split screen is LEGO Batman. And we can see our resident genius Groxar made an excellent implementation in LibGDX. This technique is much more involved and actually leans more on camera manipulation and masks. Make sure to watch our video on masks and check the link in the description for Groxar's code example. Remember that fit viewport had black borders? You must use that viewport, they don't necessarily have to be black. You can overlay it on top of another viewport with a pattern. Or better yet, fill it with relevant player statistics. Make the gutter part of the game. That's viewports in a nutshell. Like I said, there isn't much to them once you get the basics down. Good luck on your aspect ratio and black bar adventures! what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. As soon as they separate, hit them with everything you've got. Roger that. It's right to pity them, Mark. Wrong to value them over your own kind. 